small region. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Manuel. Uh, I'll be taking you up on a journey, 15 minutes, and five minutes for Q&A, questions and answers if you have. And this topic will be focused on livable cities. And livable cities are also uh, food producing cities. But why are they so important? And why do you see them in the news nowadays? And this century is all about where we are going to live. Um, and how can Thailand benefit from uh, all this new uh, trending development? A couple of weeks ago, we won a very major tender in Singapore. Singapore, as you know, has no food whatsoever. It imports everything. We won the tender, and this plant, 330 hectares, is supposed to produce food for nearly half the Singaporeans. And why do they do that? And what's on the horizon that everybody is initiating with producing food? And why should it be locally in, in its urban delta? It's looking a bit more like how can we optimize per square meter the yields? Can we produce mushrooms? Can we use hydroponics? Can we build a greenhouse on top? And it should be all within that same environment where people are living. Not too long ago, 100 years ago, urban agriculture built culture actually existed in most of the cities. We pushed it away further and further until it used to be transported back to the cities. And in the next generation to come, particularly in Gen Z, you will see that we are going to bring it back. We're going to, we're going to make it more sustainable. And we have to create a job for livelihoods. But this journey starts with one major challenge, energy. Where are we going to get the energy from? To cool climates down, to grow food in tropical regions. You could cool down and grow strawberries right here, right now, but how much are you going to pay for it? So it's this endless journey of resilience that everybody is looking for all across the world, uh, cities in Asia, cities in Europe and the US. A new currency is set by the BlackRock CEO for the next generation. The livable cities will have, will outlast uh, sustainably very long. But this means also we need to look things very differently. We need to assess the inputs and outputs of what we produce. And yes, we've produced a lot of things in the but how can we extract that waste heat, that feed, and how can we connect the dots? It requires an ecosystem, and I think that's why I'm so grateful and, um, for this organization to set this, uh, this podium. It is a journey that we will take upon for a couple of decades, and hopefully we're in time. Proof of concepts should be bridged globally, whether it's from the US or the EU, it is important that we tailor solutions to the Thai industry and also involve communities to create uh, jobs and be an entrepreneur. And nowadays it becomes very sexy to do indoor growing or having a greenhouse that performs growing mushrooms or strawberries or whatsoever. And proof of concepts of carbon-free examples are here. Like this uh, concept called Kipster, carbon-free chicken farm, fully self-sufficient, and it's being fed by its surroundings. But not only that is a good example. Small rooftops can leverage up the sun with aquaponics underneath, and leafy vegetables up to 130 tons a year can be produced just locally. Or floating dairy farms. Dairy farms can be in the, in the river, don't need to take up that much land. Carbon friendly, self-sufficient, not yet fully carbon neutral. And these species are very interesting. They have been thriving the last decade for all across the world and they don't need sunlight. They can grow in every cell. A premium crop, a lot of margin to be made. Or another example is having the actual dairy production just around the corner, where uh, this facility produces milk 
right in the environment where you arrived. We've invested also in uh, Mozambique back in the days. Um, the anticipation is that the dairy farm, uh, cattle, beef in the future will not come from Singapore continuously or from Australia or from um, the US. It come directly from, from an area where we can produce culture beans. Also, biological competition. Something that we could use to take out those chemicals, herbicides, and pesticides. In horticulture, it's about reduction of resources, optimizing yields. In building, it's about climate as a service, using less energy. And yet today, it can be announced that 30% of energy can be saved if we would actually put smart controls in those buildings. And in between those verticals, you can identify opportunities where people can start a business, grow a leaf green, grow some mushrooms, or other crops. But all those new concepts in the last decade have not been there for nothing. We were urged to change. The moment, the, the way we grow food at the moment is going to be initiating mass migration. Not visible today, but in a couple of years to go. Droughts will make field farming very, very tough. And we really need to look for new ways of growing this food. And the unlucky ones among us is predicted by the UN around 8 million people will pay the price. So everybody's reinventing the wheel and thinking of new ways to grow food. We cannot continue like this. And there are many examples that we can bridge. And in the, in the West, the US and the EU spend over $7,000 billion every year in subsidies for the top mega companies. Two weeks ago, they didn't get it in Paris. It was drastically reduced. But this shows an opportunity, because our regional farming in APEC, 420 million smallholders, are much more resilient, resilient than to that on a few big problems. If we can facilitate that particular growth, we'll be able to build this whole around us. And initiations like the BCG or uh, other good examples is the way to go. It's the only way out is here in the city and its environment. We should not be waiting for many uh, uh, policies to be made. You and I, we can start tomorrow. And Gen Z is already starting. This is an example of Shanghai City. 10 years ago, food insecurity was nearly 100%. There was no food being grown in Green Belt or in Brown Cities. They initiated a new plan using the Green Belts around the cities, identifying the brown fields, the old economy models, and being reused to grow fresh produce. And that's been very successful, and today they're increasing their food security over and over. Here's an example of London. Very dense population. 2% left on the land. And that 2% can produce over 730 tons of food, which is 60% of their consumption. Not only London, also New York has uh, been less reliant on food security and uses its own delta to grow more greenhouse within greenhouses and indoor farms. This goal is not being like for nothing. Uh, because there is there's little time left. And we, we are all working together across countries and nations with city planners, city governments, to initiate this new, new, new initiatives. It's the environmental problem, the social can be co coherence, getting the greenery back, but it all starts with food. And the Netherlands has been a great example. The Netherlands, some call it a country, we still call it a city. It's perhaps one of the first producing city in the world. There is a next exporter on festival, world's second, second largest. But that came with an ambition, and that ambition was not rocket science. It practically said, no more famine to pay the high price. 
consolidating land, we do things differently. And that single law that changes everything was no more chemicals into the soil. And that law, maybe not from the entrepreneurs or from other policies, made people think to innovate immediately. But it went from growing into the soil to outside of the soil. And that changed everything, literally everything. The yields went up, inputs were lower, uh, produce was consistently unseasonal, and they continued innovating, and the yields kept going up. Climates, they used to uh, have climate controls to modify the perfect climates, reuse water up to 95%, reduce production of energy, and using other solutions to optimize that yield. And it didn't stop there, it also went further. They went also looking for new ways of urban development to have part of the society working and part of the society also sharing energy resources over a heat net in summer and winter time. Wastewater is being fully recirculated, cleaned, and being reused for agriculture. And as you know, water is going to be one of the challenges that we have ahead of us. Energy captured, stored underground, particularly for, for uh, agriculture, but also sustainable fisheries. Floating dairy farms, the chicken farms to go. And it simply started with dead green belt and brown feet. But we need to go to scale. If you and I start a business here, in and around uh, the area, we need to have more people join the game. Because until now, most resources of everything we have goes in that single hamburger. And still, that salad is too expensive on the shelf. So you can ask yourself, who pays the price? Is it about technology? Not at all. It's about simply an ambition and also in areas where, like Nissan, can make a really drastic big change. Like in Norway, a single thing changed the reduction of red meat consumption by simply printing the carbon footprint on, on the receipts, and people start buying less red meat. We can start small, manually, not too high in capital, but it will change our way how we do things. And that is starting here with, with, with the people, the entrepreneurs, the cities. So future cities are predicted to be greener, but greener, not that food. Circular, low carbon, and surely you cannot be a smart city without any food production. So you ask yourself, where do we begin? Thank you very much. Okay, now it's time for the Q&A sessions. We have the questions. You can raise your hand 